Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to our seminar on missing men. Five sessions of teaching on how to reach men for Jesus today. We aim to be very practical, sometimes a little controversial, but always constructive. And we want to share with you what God has been teaching us about the opportunities that we have nowadays to reach men with the message of how to become God's man on earth. Now, if we're to be successful in reaching men, the first priority is prayer. There is no substitute, no trick of the trade that I can share with you which replaces believing prayer. And so we're going to start our time together and close our time together by praying. Now, if I was teaching this seminar back in my center in Cumbria, then we would in fact be teaching this over a period of three days. Part of that time you would spend with me walking along the lane or up the fell side, and unfortunately I couldn't bring the Eden Valley down with me today, uh, so we can't have that. But what we are going to do is condense two days of teaching into one. And uh, I will show you how in fact to get more than 24 hours into one day. We've given you a copy of an evangelism cookbook with a number of ideas, some of them specially for reaching men, and that's for you to take home and read at your leisure. So there's part of the course. We also have uh, a manual, and I want to take you through this particular uh, manual in about five minutes flat, and then we'll turn to page eight and start the rest of the teaching. So let me take you through, just in a moment or two, all that there is in the manual and then you can read it when you get home or read it next week. The opening page is about winning the men and then on page seven some secular advice on rules for success in the 1990s. Uh, if you want to build a fellowship team then there's some interesting ideas. Our material that we'll work through in our five sessions starts on page eight and goes through to page 16 and then on the next page is one of my favorite comments. I know you believe, you understand what you think I said, but I'm not sure that you realize that what you heard is not what I meant. Work that out over coffee, but you'll find that sometimes we say things and we think we've said them clearly, but in fact the other man has not heard a word, or at least he's not heard what we thought we were saying. And so on page 19, I've put three quotations from three different sources. Roland Allen wrote a lot of books on missionary work overseas, and he argues that the man who goes overseas has to undergo a training course and understand the language and the culture and the history and the geography of the country that he's going to. Now, I believe that's important in the United Kingdom today. We really do have to understand the culture of the people we're trying to reach. Cyril Fletcher used to, have, uh, used to read odd odes on the Esther Ranson show. Uh, I have no uh, information as to whether, in fact, he is a churchman or a Christian believer, but he does say a very important thing in the middle of that paragraph on page 19. If you're going to communicate you have to get into the skin of the other man. You have to realize the size of his understanding, to realize the narrowness sometimes of his vision, the size of his kind of life and existence compared with yours. An almost impossible thing to do, but if you're going to communicate, that's what you have to do. I heard someone uh, talking, he was giving a very learned talk to a group of unemployed men. He was talking about the second coming of the Lord. He was talking about the issue of the rapture, which was a particular theme of his. But the furthest that these unemployed young folk could think was the following Thursday when they got their next gyro check. That's the furthest into the future that they could think. And the man wasn't communicating because he wasn't inside their skin. Quote C from Oswald Saunders says, repeat an idea in at least three different ways. That's why there are three quotations on the page. 
Don't restrict yourself to uh, just the Bible for information. There's an advert for Epson printers giving ways to sharpen up your business letters. Tw page 22 will refer to the papers and the television viewing. What do you remember? Well, only a small proportion of what you hear, but more than twice as much if you see and hear it. So we need to be presenting our message visually as well as verbally. There on page 25 is Chris Bonington getting people to the top. He's talking about mountaineering. If you're leading a fellowship, there are some good ideas in there. 26 is about Korea. 27, the new breed of pensioner, the whoopies, the well-off older people. And on page 28, a series that was on Radio 4 and is due to be repeated about uh, public speaking. They interviewed actors and politicians and uh, church people to see what makes a good speaker. You never get a second chance to make a first impression. Think about that and think about the first impression your church makes when men walk in. And then from verse 30, uh, page 31, a series, a little series of five sort of very basic studies on how to get men who are not used to talking about their faith, set them off talking about their faith. It does some silly things, but I promise it works. You get a handful of men and run through that five-week series and I'll guarantee that they'll be talking a little more about their faith at the end of the series than they were at the start. On page 37, some of the population changes that uh, the church has to face. If your teenage work over the next few years stays with the same number of teenagers coming every week, you're actually making an advance. You're not losing ground. You're actually advancing because the number of teenagers is going down. Therefore, to keep the same number coming to your meeting, you're getting a higher proportion of the teenagers in the community. But look at that uh, age bracket 45 to 59, the growth of that age bracket. And a lot of men in that 45 to 59 age bracket. There's a target area for your evangelism. Of course, when you go home and share some of the bright ideas that you've learnt with your own home church, they'll say, oh, well, it wouldn't work here, or uh, we've never done it that way, or it'd cost too much, or it's not in the budget. And just to save you having problems with those suggestions, on page 38, I've listed 45 reasons why you couldn't possibly do any of the suggestions that we make today, and uh, that means that you'll have more am ammunition than anyone else who comes to uh, talk on that sort of line. Well, there you are. In about uh, seven or eight minutes, we've gone through the manual. Now we come back to page eight. And let me mention the things that we are taking for granted. I'm not going to take time today to defend the Bible, get uh, Josh McDowell to do that sometime. We are taking it for granted that you believe that this book of God is a special book and that this is God's message. Someone asked me just recently, why doesn't God send a special message to men? I said, He has. It's a library, 66 books of it, and uh, perhaps you ought to read the message He's sent. I take it for granted you believe in the Bible. I take it for granted that you know what the good news is, that men have gone their own way, they've become self-centered, their self-centeredness has led to stupidity and led to sin, and it's bound them all up. And they've separated, been separated from God, and they can't get back in touch with God by their own efforts, religious, social, educational, or any other way. And it is Jesus, because of His coming and dying, who brings men who failed back into the forgiveness of God. I'm not spending time arguing the case for the gospel. I take it that you know what the gospel is. And I take it that you are already praying. We've already spent a moment in prayer, and that will be emphasized as we go through the day. And the last thing I'm taking for granted is that you are convinced that it is the work of God, the work of the Spirit of God, to convict and to convert men. I went to, uh, to do a tour of an engineering factory one time, and uh, the managing director met me, uh, came across his sort of office with his hand outstretched to shake hands, and he said, oh, Mr. Cook, you've come to convert me. And I said, no, sir, I've come to look around your factory, please. And anyway, I couldn't convert you, 
he'd have to do that. He said, when you've been around the factory, come and talk some more. And I did, to find that his wife had become a Christian about a month previous. And this man was running as fast as he could away from anything religious, and God had sent a preacher into his own factory to have a look around. But we can't do the converting. That's the work of God. Now, instead of me doing all the talking today, I want to get some feedback from you, and I want particularly to ask you this question straight away. What do you hope to get out of today? What do you hope to gain from today? What are your expectations? Uh, what do you want to learn about? And we've left a little space in the manual, and we're going to give you about a minute or so uh, to get a pen and put down in a few words what you hope to gain. Have you noticed I've repeated the thing three times? The same question from three angles. What do you hope to gain? What are you hoping to get out of it? You've given up some time, you've given up some money, and I appreciate that. Now, what are you really hoping to learn about? Let me give you a moment to write it down and then see, in fact, if I'm on the same wavelength and have got uh, on my list the sort of things that you want to know about. Let me give you just a minute to write that down. You're all scribbling happily away. I'm glad to get you working so early in the morning on a Saturday. Uh, let me pick up some of the things that similar groups to yourselves have asked us to cover in the seminar. If, in fact, you feel that what you've written down isn't listed in these half dozen areas, then uh, perhaps I can ask you at coffee break time to come and mention that to me, and we'll make sure that we do pick up your issue. We've had people who've got plans about their outreach to men in their church, and they've been saying we'd like some sort of confirmation if we're on the right lines. We've had some people where they are the only person who's come from their church or fellowship, and they ask the question, well, what could I do? You know, even if I get a bright idea, what could I do in my church? Well, we want to show you today how to bring about change without causing chaos. Those of you who are ministers will appreciate that, and uh, we'll demonstrate that to you as the day goes along. Maybe you're after learning from others, and we'll have some group discussion. Maybe you want some fresh ideas, or you feel you're doing something wrong and want to identify that and put it right. Or possibly, and uh, during the whole session, we'll be coming up with different ways in which men seem to think about religious matters different than women think. And those man facts are scattered through the notes, and hopefully that'll be a help to you. Here's a story that Jesus told. Maybe that's not right. A story? Aren't stories things that are made up and not true? Here's an incident, probably something that actually happened. Here's some of Jesus' teaching, factual teaching, practical teaching, about a farmer. Now, this is like one of my Cumbrian farmers. They're always a bit concerned. You know, either it's uh, too dry and the grass isn't growing, or it's too wet and they can't get the machinery on the ground uh, to cut the grass. Uh, we don't have many vineyards up in Cumbria. I have to confess that. Jesus talked about a man who had two sons. And he said to number one son, go and work in the vineyard today. And number one son, who was in a rebellious mood, I've got two sons. If your number one son's in a rebellious mood, you'll sympathize with this farmer. Number one son said, forget it. I've worked overtime for the last month. You go and hire some more laborers. If you've got a job to do, you go and get some more people to do it and pay them to do it, rather than putting on the family. Jesus actually said, 
that that number one son thought about it, changed his mind, changed his direction, I suppose that's what the Bible means by repentance, and went to get the job done. Meanwhile, father met number two son, who was the good member of the family. You know, two sons are often like chalk and cheese. And number two son said, yes sir, I'll do that, uh, right away. I imagine that number two son was still there at five o'clock in the afternoon saying, uh, oh yes, remember that job? Yes, I'll get that job done. He was probably still there the next morning saying, oh yes, yes, that job in the vineyard, yes, I'll, I'll get on with that. But according to Jesus, number two son never did a thing. It all looked heavenly and blue, <laughs> but he never did a thing. It is no good saying the right words, we really do have to take some action. And uh, we had jokingly considered advertising this seminar as a seminar with a health warning, in that it is dangerous to lethargy. If uh, I let you go at the end of the day without having stirred you into some kind of action, ladies and gentlemen, I really will feel disappointed. Any of you who attended some of the seminars on church growth that either we ran or the Bible Society have run will know that it's a basic concept of church growth thinking to say that if a church is to grow, the minister and the leadership must want their church to grow. Sounds obvious, but uh, church growth thinking pinpointed it. If a church is to grow, and many of our churches in the United Kingdom are pyramid churches with a small leadership at the top, if the church is to grow bigger, then the leadership at the top must be prepared for changes and must want the church to grow. Well, of course we do, we say. My observation, traveling around all denominations, is that leaders do not always want their church to grow. For instance, uh, let me give you an example from Yorkshire. I'll not tell you which church because your uncle might be a deacon there or uh, uh, might be related to, to the minister or something. But a church in Yorkshire where the minister is a pastor par excellence. He really is brilliant. I have rarely met a man who is as concerned for other people as this man. His church has grown from somewhere around 30 members to over 100 members in the last two and a half years. So that's the rapid sort of growth in a, a hard sort of area of the industrial north. Now he knows that if the church is now to grow from 100 members to 200, he is going to have to change. Because you cannot pastor 200 people. In fact, I doubt if it's possible to pastor 100 people with all the pressures that there are on lives nowadays. But certainly when it grows bigger, he won't be able to know every detail of every family and pray for those, uh, weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice. He'll have to delegate some of the jobs of visiting. He'll have to learn new skills of team leadership. And he knows that that will challenge his very reason for being. When anyone meets him, they call him pastor. But if the church is to grow further, he is going to have to develop new sort of skills. And the same with, uh, with us if we're leaders in a church. In every church that I visit, there is a kind of uh, pecking order uh, amongst the men as well as amongst the women. It's usually seen in the kitchen over which kind of cups can be used for which sort of meetings. I don't know whether that... Re oh, it does register with a few of you. If you're in a church that only has men as deacons, I'm not defending that, but if you are in a church that has only men as deacons and they need seven deacons and you are one of the only seven men in the church, then if you can stand up, you're going to get elected to the diaconate. No problem. Now, I know you say, oh, I want to give it up. If anyone came along, I'd give it up. But that's not always what we mean in our hearts, though we say it with our lips. And I find sometimes church leaders feel the tension of growth. And so we limit growth to what is acceptable. In fact, it was Eddie Gibbs, who a Church of England minister who's now teaching church growth in, in the United States. It was Eddie Gibbs who said, we practice discreet spiritual birth control. We want to be known as an evangelical church and we want some people to get converted now and again, but not too many or it'll disturb us. It'll disturb our leadership. 
and we make least effort to seriously reach the men and the new breed of professional woman. That's another area where the church is not touching at all. Because these people, professional men, men in general and professional women, are the most dangerous newcomers of all. Here's a church over on the, east, on the west side of the United Kingdom. And a businessman, a senior executive for a company with many million pounds of turnover, got converted, marvelously converted, down on business in London. He goes home and he goes along to his local church. It happens to be a Baptist church. He uh, receives the teaching. Eventually he's baptized and becomes a church member. And he goes to his first church meeting just recently. And at the end of the meeting he said to the minister, he said, uh, if you don't mind, I'll not come to any church business meetings in the future. Well, the minister said, I understand, uh, Mr. X, I, I understand about it. Uh, you're a busy, busy man, you won't have the time to come. No, said the new Christian, when I attend meetings, I expect to get things done. And they'd spend all evening, I think, talking about which color toilet rolls to have in the loo of the ladies' and the gents' toilet and whether it should be the same or different. Now, people will challenge that. Men will challenge that. And that's why sometimes as leaders, we're not quite so keen on having them around. If you've not read the book, take a look at it. Dr. R. M. Cantor, spelt K-A-N-T-E-R. Her book is called The Change Masters, uh, probably one of the most significant business books of the 1980s, The Change Masters by Dr. R. M. Cantor. She lectures American businessmen and uh, she has recently been working just with the top groups, the IBMs and the Ford managements of this world. And she was invited to look at their management structure, their senior management structure, and to give them some advice. The result of her surveys of several leading American companies was to say, uh, you've got an executive council, a leadership council, but where is your council of youth? Where are the young men in leadership? And here were her comments. First, she says, as men rise in a company, so they become increasingly isolated from the real world outside their company. As they rise in the company, they become isolated from the real world. Then, she said, secondly, they become cut off from any criticism. Because they're senior, no one dare criticize them. Thirdly, she says, they then grow suspicious of any new idea introduced by anyone lower down the structure. I thought she was talking about the Christian church. Actually, she was talking about IBM, management structure. Doesn't it happen? As we rise in the company, as we go along in the Christian world, we become increasingly isolated from the real world of the non-Christian outside. And then we become cut off from ideas, cut off from criticism, and anyone who comes along with a new idea, if they're a new Christian, they say, ah, well, they don't understand how things are in our church, and we block them out. So this seminar is a call to action. I believe that we have today the best opportunities to reach men that the church has certainly had in my ministry time. I started Christian ministry in 1957. I was very young at the time, I'll just point that out to you, but uh, 1957 when I started, and this is the most opportune time I have ever seen, and the biggest numbers of men responding to the Christian gospel I have ever known in those years of ministry. But it isn't enough just to say we want to reach the men. This is a call to action. We really will have to do some work, and we really will have to grasp some of the nettles uh, about people who say concentrating on men is sexist, and we really will have to challenge our use of time because there are only seven evenings in the week, and some men will be so exhausted on five of those that they couldn't possibly come out to another meeting. Incidentally, watch that word meeting. As far as business people go, the last thing they want to attend is another meeting. They've had three at work, and they were deadly. Find yourself a new name for the events that you put on. I've been uh, claiming recently that I want to lose weight. But uh, I haven't changed my lifestyle, and I haven't changed my eating habits, 
and I haven't changed my exercise pattern, and uh, I don't have to be a prophet so to tell you that I'm not losing any weight, and I don't think I'm likely to lose any weight. If a church comes along and says that they want to reach men, but they're not going to change their meetings, they're not going to change their use of time, they're not going to reallocate church resources, well, I see them fulfilling their own prophecy that you can't reach men anyway. Remember, if you have questions as we move along, we'll be picking up those questions in the break times. Uh, where you receive coffee, you will also find that there are a number of books and leaflets, and I want just to take a moment to look at some of those. We have been pressing some of our friends in publicity to produce items that could be used to invite men to meetings. And Christian Publicity Organization of Worthing have been attempting to do that. There's the do-it-yourself man. Uh, there's Welcome Home. I think uh, you'll have to agree with me, ladies and gentlemen, both of those are middle-class men. I mean, they're both uh, three-bedroom, semi-detached type men, at least, aren't they? But they have been trying with other items. There's the story of a real man, Dave the Lad, uh, and a picture of him drinking his uh, lager can on the back. Uh, there's a picture, there's a, a sort of uh, cartoon style presentation of the day that changed the world and uh, that's been used amongst men of all types. Even businessmen are not avid readers and often uh, the different presentation can be used as a way of getting them to read. And some of the books we found most effective in reaching men, here's Val Greaves book, Your Verdict. Val Greaves is a lawyer in Manchester. He starts off with the simple question, what is evidence? And we've had a lot in our newspapers about what evidence is acceptable in a court of law. So that's where he starts. What is evidence? The book's called Your Verdict. It sells at £1.50 at the present time. Then he gives the evidence for Jesus, and the evidence especially for the resurrection. And he finishes by saying, now you've heard the evidence, you have to give a verdict. You cannot avoid giving a verdict. One of the things we've missed out with men is telling them they have to make, their make a decision. And actually he finishes with a chapter and I think it includes a prayer as well. And I've known some men get converted through reading that book. David Watson, before he went home to glory, wrote, uh, Is Anyone There? A book about finding God. One half of us finds it difficult to believe in God. The other half is intrigued by the possibility that he really might exist. Now that's a man thought. He might be out there. And David Watson takes that starting point and gets on that wavelength and uh, argues again, of course, that Jesus is the way to God. Case Against Christ by John Young has been uh, recently revised. It uh, deals with all the sort of questions that uh, some men ask. Uh, you can't believe the Bible. Science has disproved God. Why does God allow suffering? Uh, what's the difference between Jesus and Buddha and Muhammad? Uh, maybe that's a book for you to read rather than give away so that you've got the ammunition and the information to answer the questions. But uh, that's a book that we commend to you. If you have a man who claims that he's Church of England, and many of them do, then here's the book for that man, Finding God, written by James Jones, who is the vicar of Christ Church Clifton in Bristol. He's often on uh, morning uh, radio with a five-minute thought. Men are not good readers, most men. And James Jones picks that idea up. His chapters are usually four pages in length, three or four pages in length. That's just about the right length for most men. And he takes an incident from real life, he shows how the Bible has something to say about that, and then he turns it round to bring a challenge. So chapter after chapter is in Finding God on that sort of line. It's for those who are searching asking whether there is a God. And we've known men in particular helped by that book. And the other one I want to recommend to you is Andrew Knowles' book, Finding Faith. The Lion publication, beautifully produced, of course, in all the colors and all the pictures. This is the book that, particularly in uh, rural areas, we found effective. Many of my farmer friends are not uh, well-educated, although they are intelligent men. And this has been the sort of book that they've dipped into. He starts with the question, why am I here? What's it all about? That's a man question. Why am I here? 
And he says, if you're asking the question, why am I here? You have to ask the question, is there a God? And if you ask the question, is there a God? You have to say, who was Jesus Christ? So that's his sort of argument through the book. All of those leaflets and books available so that if you want to buy one for a friend today or uh, take samples home, they're all there for you to use. Now, here's a fact about man, and uh, you should have a space on the bottom of page 8 to, uh, to slot that one in. The fact about man, that man sees better than he hears. It's true, of course, for all people in an audio-visual age that the visual impact makes a lot of difference. But I think it is especially true for man that what he sees makes a bigger impact. And uh, I just wonder what sort of thing men see and how much do they remember of what you're presenting. Now, this particular slide you have in your manual, so you don't particularly need to take notes on that, but it does stress the fact that you remember more than twice as much if you see it and hear it. Here's a bit of research done from a different angle on recall of information. And if you want, uh, if you can find a, a, a corner to sort of scribble those down, maybe you'd like to. Recall of information of, for the average intelligent person, of reasonable material. So you're not presenting very technical material, you're presenting material of general knowledge. And if I just tell you the things, then I set you an exam after lunch, and, uh, well, you remember three quarters of it. I set you an exam in three months' time, and you'll only remember 2% of what I've said so far this morning. You'll remember the pictures that you've seen this morning more than all the hundreds of words. But if I demonstrated, if, if I said, that is a book, and uh, so you saw it visually. Uh, this is a pen, and so you saw it visually. This is a watch, and you saw it visually. You'd remember more because you'd seen as well as heard. But here's the interesting difference. If, as against telling you, if I show it to you, you remember slightly more after three months. But if I can do both, if I can show it to you and tell it to you at the same time, you'll only be slightly better after lunch. But in three months' time, you'll be eight times better. 16% recall. Now, let me say it, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to learn today. And that's why we've got a lot of visuals as well as talking. And if you really want to get the Christian message across to men, to men who are not as antagonistic as you might think, if we want to get the Christian message across, then we'll have to demonstrate it, not only in lives, but also when we're trying to teach it, we'll have to do it with pictures as well as with words. Okay, can I switch that off? You've got those notes down, if you wanted them. What message do your premises give to men? When they arrive, what do they see? It might be worth going round, having a look. Many churches, they see some of the playgroup toys around. They see some of the Sunday school pictures up on the wall. Now, I'm not against having Sunday school pictures up on wall. I would prefer them to be this month's Sunday school pictures, not ones from three years ago. But uh, pictures up on the wall is okay. They see some of these nice posters. Most of the nice posters either have uh, children or animals on them. You ever notice that? And the only notice board that has got some decent, notice board, uh, decent notices on is the one advertising the ladies' group. And there's some broken furniture around. That proves no men come to this church because if any decent do-it-yourself man came to this church, he would have mended the furniture or burnt it at bonfire night. The impression visually we give is often that this place is for children and women, but not for the men. And uh, will you remember? 
And again, you have it in your manual just to remind you, you never get a second chance to make that first impression. If your first impression is lots of women and lots of children, and we'll pick this up later on in our ideas uh, to counteract the issue, then you're going to have problems. We've adopted, as someone said, a lifeboat mentality in our evangelism, the mentality of women and children first, and the men have really heard what we've been saying, and so they stay away. Now, if you turn the page to page 9, let me give you two serious re reasons why we have more women than men in our churches, and you've got room to make notes on page 9. First, and I outline this, I'll illustrate it later. First of all, we have preached a need oriented message and therefore attracted women because the women are more prepared to admit their needs. Now you try finding out men's needs and try finding out women's needs and you'll come to the same conclusion that I do, that the women are prepared to talk about it and the men have been taught to hide it. And we've preached, often we've preached, if you have a need, Jesus can meet your need. And the women are prepared to admit their need, and so they've responded. And the men who've been taught not to admit their needs have hardened up. We'll develop that later on. Secondly, let me suggest that we have inherited, in historical terms, we have inherited a bias towards women's work which can be traced back to the Great War, the 1418 World War. Now, all war is atrocious. The 1418 war was perhaps the most atrocious. Five million men went from this country. Incidentally, may I just digress to say, if you read history at university, I'm now doing a Rolf Harris act. I'm painting with a big brush. I'm not doing a finely textured drawing. Five million men went from our country to the First War, the 1418 War. One million died. They never came back. Two million of them were so shell-shocked by it all, so God-shocked by it all, that they gave up on God. I'll tell you one of the reasons. Someone wrote some interesting research on the Welsh Fusiliers and the regiments that went out to the 1418 War. Often in the trenches, the men who were the officers were the deacons. The ministers were the chaplains. The men who were the officers were often deacons. And these were the men who'd been in the Welsh valleys, in the chapels. And it was their deacon from the old chapel, or from down the valley, who said, right, up we go, up and over. Now, I know he wasn't responsible for all the decisions that were made. Some appalling decisions were made. But when they did go up and over, there was an, a, a German machine gun to shoot them all down. One million never came back. Two million gave up on God because of that issue. Now, it's a very naive statement in a way, but if there were five men and five women in 1914 who went to church, then in 1918 one of those men isn't around anymore and two of them don't come back to church. So you have five women to two men, which is roughly what you have in proportion in most of the mainstream churches between two and three women to every man in your church. But here's the more important issue of the historical event. Women's part in the 1418 war was to take over the tasks vacated by the men. If you remember any of the newsreels, it was all going to be over in a few months, wasn't it? So the men marched off to the war, and the ladies took over, the women took over, whilst the men were away. And what they did was that they kept things as they were. The loyalty of the ladies was to keep the patterns that existed, or if they had to adapt the pattern because of wartime economy, they modified it very slightly, but they wanted to keep things so that when their menfolk came back, they would find things as they'd been when they left. When the war ended, the women were never actually replaced by the returning men. And so you were left with churches biased towards preservation biased towards economizing and biased towards women's 
intuitive sort of spirituality. Women do have, the old Lancashire word for it is more nous. Uh, women do have more common sense when it comes to religious matters than men. And so women were, were assuming things, and the other women understood them, but the other outside men didn't. And you got the main evangelistic thrust of many churches became its Sunday school work staffed by its ladies. And you had churches that were into preservation, keeping things as they were, into economy, they couldn't spend too much money, and they were into this bias towards women's work. And that's what you've got in many of the mainline churches today. You had a church meeting recently? Did someone raise a problem about how much you were threatening to spend on that new piece of equipment? Because we're biased towards the economy issue. Now here's a second fact about man. Man is easily distracted from a religious message. Indeed, my observation is that whereas women seem to have a sympathy towards religious issues, Whereas certainly women are prepared to sort the chaff from the wheat when they hear a religious message, and they can take in a message from another man and, and still sort of make sense of it, I'm discovering that many men outside our churches find that if the message is coming to them through a woman, they rule it out. They simply say, she's not in the world that I'm in. She doesn't sit where I sit. She doesn't know how things are. And so men have huge difficulty in accepting spiritual testimony from a woman. They see it, see it as irrelevant to real life. It does challenge family service as the main evangelistic tool to reach the men. If your church is using family service as the way to reach the men, let me just ask you to rethink that. Because you see, at family service, the kids take part, right? You get the children to take part. And so the converted wife drags along her unconverted husband because the children are performing. And he comes in to this uh, service where everyone is in and all the children are there. And what happens, there's a lot of noise, there are children climbing all over the place or climbing under the pews or playing with their cars along the back. Now the women don't bat an eyelid, they don't turn a hair. Unless their own child is, falls off the, the seat, then they, they sort of respond. But I've seen women in family services and children are climbing all over the place but the women are sitting on the edge of their seat listening to the message. But not the men. The men are distracted by all the noise and all these sort of things, whereas the woman is used to the noise of the children around. In fact, the only time she pays attention is when Johnny goes quiet. Is that not true? But on the other hand, the man is not used to that sort of interference, and he can't take it. He doesn't hear the message. I personally, now this is only a personal issue, but I personally have not known a man to get converted at a family service. I've known many women, but I personally have not seen a man converted at a family service. They're easily distracted from the religious message. Now, why am I so optimistic about our present day opportunities for reaching men? Let me give you two basic reasons, and uh, hopefully you're with me on page 10. Two reasons why I'm optimistic about reaching men today. The first, letter A, is that there is a religious search in the United Kingdom at the present time. There is a religious search. Now this is not me, as a Christian speaker, putting rose-tinted spectacles on and saying things are better than you thought. These are the non-Christian researchers, the social scientists of our day, studying the trends. They're, they say that there is a religious search in the United Kingdom the like of which has not been seen this century. If you think things are happening in Eastern Europe, watch out for things happening in the United Kingdom, not politically but in religious terms. There is a search for, to use the jargon phrase, an otherworldly meaning to life. Something that makes sense of life that isn't just the material things of life. That uh, religious search is shown in a number of different ways. 
It's shown in uh, radio and television matters. Here are some facts and figures. It doesn't uh, particularly matter if you don't get them all down. I want to quote from David Winter, who until recently was head of uh, religion on BBC. He says, every week about 11 million people in Britain hear one or another of the religious programs on BBC Radio. 11 million listen to BBC Radio religion. Almost as many watch a religious program on BBC television. And nearly as many as that watch a religious program on ITV. So over 10 million for ITV audiences. Add on the audiences for religion on independent radio, and even while allowing for quite a degree of duplication, you have an audience of at least 20 million adults. Allowing for the fact that they see a religious program and listen to a radio program, 20 million. David Winter says the explanation, and that slide simply shows that uh, things like pause for thought and Sunday service uh, are in the ratings that any questions and woman's hour are in. David Winter says the explanation, well supported by evidence from letters, is that this country is now in a condition of widespread religious ignorance but not religious indifference. Widespread religious ignorance, but not religious indifference. And that is why all the Eastern faiths are sending their missionaries. That is why all the groups and the cults are growing in the United Kingdom, because there is a religious search. Even the television producers are saying, if religious programs get high ratings, I'll make religious programs. The, uh, they're writing characters into their, their, the scripts of television plays who are strong Christians. There used to be a time when the only Christians you saw on, uh, on television were sort of people who were a bit sort of uh, like that, weren't they? Vicars usually who sort of uh, were a bit odd. But now they're writing in strong, often charismatic Christians to really say something in the program. You can go to Smith's and you'll find they've doubled the size of their religious book area. Not because Mr. W. H. Smith has got converted, but because he finds religious books are selling. You'll find religious videos at Woolworths. Not because Mr. Woolworths has become a Christian, but he finds that religious videos sell. The size of response in Billy Graham's last mission and in the Live Link centers indicates this spiritual hunger, a religious search. Not a Christian search. That's our job to make it a Christian search, but it is a religious search. Secondly, my reason for optimism is that this decade, the 80s, has been a decade of change for men, especially a challenge to men. Here's a man in his late 40s. He'd built up a company down in the West Country. And then he was taken over, first by another national firm in the United Kingdom, and then by an American firm. They told him that his little branch down in the West Country wasn't needed anymore, and his job was to make all the 40 men redundant. He did it. it took him a couple of weeks, and it almost broke his heart, because many of the men were personal friends, but he made them all redundant, paid them off with their redundancy pay. He then got a phone call. He didn't even get a visit. He got a phone call from the American office that said, now, sir, you are redundant. Here's your golden handshake, and at uh, 48, 49, he's well aware that he's not going to get another management position in that realm. For the first time in his life, he asks the question, what is it all about? Why are we here? He thought it was all about getting his qualifications and getting his company and getting his position. And now it's all fallen apart. And that man, bless him, has been led to the Lord by a godly Anglican vicar who's shown him what life is all about. But only the redundancy issue made him stop to think. Now, there have been changes in employment security that have affected men. That's the first change. The second change is that there have been changes in working practices. The Japanese influence in management, if you like, has meant that men can't just now put the same nut on the same bolt. They have to be prepared to be moved around to where there's shortage of men or where extra uh, production line is needed. And those changes in working practices have affected men. The third change is the change in roles. 
The women's lib movement has done a lot of good, but it certainly has changed the sort of balance of power. Uh, you can now be a house husband. If your wife can earn a much bigger salary than you can, you can stay at home and look after the children, and she can have the allowances and go out to work. And the DHSS will accept you as a house husband. If the DHSS accepts you, I tell you, it must really be official. You now can be a house husband. In fact, you can go into London stores nowadays and you can buy yourself, if you're one of the new men, uh, what is called a baby bonder. That, uh, in fact, is made of uh, terrelene. The milk bottle that feeds the baby goes into the top and you cuddle the baby to your chest and you feed him. You smile, gentlemen, even the ladies are smiling. That sells at 15 pounds and is selling well in London because men want to be linked to their babies and some of the house husbands, that's the way. Feed the baby and cuddle him at the same time. Changes in roles have affected men far more than they've affected women. Fourth, there have been changes in sexual relationships. Contraception has, of course, given women more power. Contra contraception aids have given them more power. And mentioning aids means, again, for secular man, an area where he felt love was possible has been shattered. I'm not talking about people within the churches, but outside the churches, many men thought there was some kind of security in a relationship with another man, and that has been shattered. Changes in sexual relationships. And the fifth change that's affected our decade are changes in the environment. If you want the issue that men are more angry about than any other, it is the issue of the destruction of our world's natural resources. The ozone layer, the, uh, the change to lead free in the petrol, it's the women maybe who've, who've suggested it, but it's the men who've actually taken the car down to the garage and got the car changed over. Prince Charles said recently three million people are members of environmental groups in the United Kingdom. And that's more than the membership of all the political parties put together. If you want an issue that men are concerned about, they're concerned about the environment. So five changes have hit men over these last few years. Changes in employment security, changes in working practice, changes in roles, changes in sexual relationships, changes in the environment. Historically, periods of change have always been periods of opportunity in religious matters. You want a serious study of that? There is a book, of course, that was written about the Wesleyan revival, that France had a revolution, a secular move, and Britain had a Christian revival and was saved from the bloodshed of the French Revolution. But the same waves were sweeping Britain and the continent, and France went one way and Britain went the other way. A period of change is always a period of opportunity in religious matters. So we have a religious search in a period of change which makes men open to the Christian message as never before. And here is another fact about men. Man wants to back the winner. I'm not just talking about the shop floor man and what's running that day. Man wants to back the winner. And it seems to me, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, that our task is to put the message of God's victory. You want to know who wins? Turn to the end of the book, the end of the library. I'll tell you who wins. If you want to be on the winning side, I'll tell you which is the winning side. We need to put the message of God's victory into language that men can understand. We'll pick that up after coffee in our second session about speaking clearly about the plan and the power and the purpose of God. And incidentally, don't uh, switch off or don't write off Grandad. Uh, 26 million people will be over 55 within a couple of years' time. 10 million of them will be retired. And if Grandad gets converted, he will have a tremendous influence upon the grandchildren. Children, the little children listen more to granddad who's got time to sit down and talk to them than they listen often to their own parents. If you want to leap a generation in your evangelism, uh, get hold of some of the granddads. They, uh, they're the key. They hold two-thirds of the country's total savings. They are younger in outlook. They're more adventurous in holidays and in leisure. 
So you line up some Christian skiing adventures across the Sahara for granddads or something, and maybe you're on to a, a winner there. Christianity is good news for men. It is freedom from the failure of the past. It is vision with the certainties of the future. It is uh, release from the despair of the present. Isn't that the message that Jesus proclaimed that first occasion in Nazareth? Jesus says, the Spirit of the Lord is on me. He has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And I'm arguing that now is the time to proclaim to men in the United Kingdom the year of the Lord's favor. You remember how it was way back in time? No, maybe you're not that old. But uh, at the beginning, there was God and man, and they used to talk to each other. And everything was environmentally friendly. Everything was green in those early days. It was all good. And the world was being run God's way. And man was God's man down on earth. The lie that man fell for was that if he did things his own way, he'd become like God. It was a lie because he was like God. He was God's man to run God's world. What happened when man went his own way was that he got himself all twisted up. I suppose it was uh, lunch break, you know, and... Uh, he had to throw his apple core somewhere, and maybe without thinking, he just threw it over his shoulder, and it landed in the, in the tube. And it wasn't all that long before man had thrown so much rubbish into the tube that man could no longer talk to God, and God could no longer talk to man. And that broke God's heart. If you read theology at university, you must forgive me now. It was as if God changed his T-shirt and uh, became God-man and actually climbed over the fence onto man's side, down into man's environment, down into man's area. And he brought one of those black plastic bags, you know, that collect all the rubbish and started collecting up all the rubbish. That's what God-man did. Collected it all up. You would have thought that man would have been pleased about that, but actually men don't like to be indebted to others. Maybe we'll pick that up later on. And man got so angry that he finished up nailing the God-man to a piece of wood. And because the God-man wouldn't let go of the rubbish he was holding, the rubbish got nailed up to the wood as well. There's a verse in the Bible, isn't there, about all our stupidity, all our sins being nailed to the cross. Jesus took them all. And then it was, uh, let me just add up, one, two, three, yes. Three days later. And man got a tap on his shoulder. And it was God saying, hey, how, big, how about being man again? How about being man as man was intended to be? That's the message. And we have the most opportune time that I have known to share that message with men. Father, we want your help, not only in understanding things, but in opening up ourselves to you so that we become filled with your presence and your power so that men notice the difference and so that they hear the message. We pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.